Ladies and gentlemen, in the age of the internet, you and I and everybody else has opinions and boy, do we love to post them for everybody to read and discuss and argue about, but there are still some universal truths out there, such as your favorite YouTuber, Gotham Chess, has a receding hairline. And also like the fact that Magnus Carlsen is an exceptional chess player and his style is what makes him fascinating. He's not a swashbuckling, you know, beat down kind of a guy like Gary Kasparov maybe was, but he's universal. His stamina in the end game is phenomenal. His positional understanding is unmatched. And in this video, I'm going to show you what happens when Magnus Carlsen discovers the equivalent of Thanos discovering the Infinity Stone. This video is all about Magnus Carlsen using the Catalan opening. Now, I'm going to take you through a handful of games. The very first one is actually about 15, 16 years old. This game is 15, 16 years old. It was played in 2007. Magnus with the white pieces is playing against Laos Portish. Portish, if you look him up, was one of the most decorated chess players of the 20th century. He was an elite chess player for over 40 years, from the 50s to the 90s. Hungarian chess grandmaster constantly competed for the world title. And Magnus, all the way back then, this was one of his first serious classical over-the-board games of the Catalan. Now, the Catalan, just in case you're not aware, I'm going to give you a 30-second breakdown, comes from a Queen's Gambit declined, and in general, the move g3 and bishop to g2. This opening relies on many times the sacrifice of this c4 pawn, sometimes the sacrifice of two pawns, and this light squared bishop becoming a beast on the diagonal. This is the perfect opening for Magnus because it's like an anaconda. It just suffers. That's the python anaconda? I don't know. I'm not a snakeologist. That's not a real word. But watch and learn as Magnus just puts on a masterclass in positional play. This is not fair. This should be cheating. I don't know. They should ban it. They should not let him play the Catalan. So g3 takes on c4 and bishop to g2. And white will very slowly bring the knight out, take this pawn, or bring this queen out and take this pawn. Now, back in the early 2000s, there was not a lot of theory developed on the Catalan, so people were not playing the critical main line, which is a very quick b5. Instead, Portish plays knight bd7. This is not really played at top level anymore. The computer isn't a huge fan, but the idea was to go like this, get out of this diagonal. That's how scary this diagonal is. And then to play the move b5, well, right now. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if you take a look at the position, it actually looks very reasonable for, uh, for black. Black unpinned the rook, and black, you know, has the extra pawn on c4, and black is going to play bishop b7 and castles. But Magnus plays the move b3. Just, what? But... We just described that the c4 pawn is going to be the weakness. No, b3. Inviting it to capture and just doing this. And white is just, just down a full pawn. Just down a full pawn, no questions asked. But what does white have? More development. So white has developed a bit more and has castled. Black has spent a little bit more time kind of getting off this diagonal and defending the pawn. White also has a very active rook, a very active queen, which goes in two directions, a very active bishop even though it's on its home square. The knight is about to jump to the center of the board. So before black is able to get stabilized at all, here comes Magnus, knight to e5. All right, trying to get into c6. So we have knight takes and this, rook d1. Look at the white pieces. Both rooks active, bishop active, queen active, e4 wins the knight. Queen goes to e7, stepping in front of the bishop. All right, the Hungarian grandmaster is now tripping over himself. It's like his shoes are tied together, right? Queen to e7, here comes the knight. Not worried about knight takes c3, because I got news for you. Magnus is not taking this back. He's not taking it back. Bishop c6 is nearly checkmate. Black has to block with something and then just lose the house. It's crazy. So knight c3, the queen pins the knight to the queen. And look at this. Magnus the savage. Rook takes d5. Not bishop takes d5. Rook takes d5. E takes d5. And now look at this beautiful move. B4. This is called an attraction tactic. You try to attract a piece to a square to play knight takes d5 and then play knight takes c7. Now, here's something funny happens. Here, Magnus actually makes kind of a shocking oversight. Um, I guess he thought he was winning. I guess he didn't see a win after knight takes d5. It looks like a very natural move. The win is quite ridiculous here. It's knight c7 king d8 or king d7, and then this check, which is kind of, yeah, and then you sack the knight, and then apparently you're winning. 
Magnus doesn't find knight c7, a very strange idea. Instead, he plays bishop a3, which the computer doesn't like. The computer doesn't like, but it's gonna, you're gonna give it a little bit of time. Suddenly, the computer's gonna go, actually, maybe I was, I, I, I was a little bit too hasty with this position. Queen c5 is on the way, queen c7 is on the way. Uh, and uh, black is just really struggling to defend the position. You'll notice that four of black's five pieces are just stuck on the back rank. And Magnus never stopped. Never stopped. Went for... Look at this. I mean, it's like black played with half the pieces. Finally, the black king was able to get to h7. But it was already too late. Magnus was up a pawn. And he was going to try to pick up b5 as well. And he... Uh, it, it was just not... It was never close. Queen c6. And black just resigned. Black didn't have to resign. He could have kept playing, but he would have lost the b5 pawn, and then he would have been down two pawns, and he was like, you know what, this was one of the worst games I've ever been a part of. I'm resigning. From start to finish, right? But this is 2007. Not a lot of people know the Catalan. You know, you can argue that Portish, he was, old, he was older at this point. You know, he was 60, 70 years old. So, oh, Magnus beating up older gentleman, you know, who had an established career, but now is past his prime. Wow, Magnus, how could you? You're top 20 in the world. This, this doesn't prove anything. This was just the beginning. Magnus didn't play the Catalan a whole lot in his career, uh, but he started playing it a lot more in the last couple of years. Uh, and um, especially after working with Daniel Dubov, it seems, for the World Championship match. Here's a guy you recognize, Anish Giri. Magnus plays d4. Now, you'll notice... There's no Queen's Gambit decline. Black plays this move order because Black is saying, well, if you play Knight C3, I'm going to play the Nimso Indian. And if you play Knight F3, then I will play this. So you can get this position through the Queen's Gambit declined or through the, uh, the Nimso Indian setup. Now, this time you'll notice that both sides have castled. Last time we had a very quick capture on C4. Now we do as well, but it's a little bit slower than last time. Now, here there is a main line, which is Queen to C2. And we will probably see this at some point in the video because there are a lot of games. Magnus here plays a sideline. He plays knight to a3. So the thing about the Catalan, which makes it also extremely dangerous for Magnus uh, to have as a weapon, is all the different move orders. Magnus loves messing around with stuff that people either haven't prepared, don't remember preparing, or just always thought was bad. Like, the move knight a3 is not played a lot because black just damages white structure, doubles those a pawns, and this just looks stupid. Nobody plays like this. Right? Like, nobody plays like this because black will just go here, play b5, bishop c6, you'll never win these pawns. Like, Magnus is like, okay, a4. What? Like, this doesn't look like it should make sense. Why are you pushing doubled a pawns on the edge of the board? Very simple. Because I want to put my bishop on a3, and then I want to go here. Like, this is what white wants. And then white's rooks are connected to flexibly stand on anywhere in the center, and he's going to take back on c4. And if black plays the move bishop d5... Then I'm just going to go rook fe1 and kick the, kick the bishop out. And again, like, this is a really bad situation. You really cannot allow e4. Because white will get two pieces for the rook and a pawn. Two pieces are better than a rook and a pawn. They just are. So queen c2, knight bd7. And at this point, black is like, okay, well, if you take, I'm going to go knight b6. Magnus is like, okay, queen c4, knight b6, you can have my pawn. So he got the c4 pawn back, gave away the other pawn, and now just has this position. Which is just... In the balance, but, you know, black can go back. White will bring the rook. Oop, white will bring the rook or bring the rook and push the pawn. Look for knight e5 and just slowly apply pressure to these pieces. Black is very passive here. Everything on the third rank. And Anish plays the move queen d5. Anish tries to simplify down the position, tries to trade the queens on the board. Look what Magnus uncorks here. Rook takes c6. What? But, okay, the idea of that move is that if this... This, and then this. If this, then this. But I don't know. What about this? Oh, easy. Let's it's time to activate the Catalan bishops. Look at this. Knight e5 hits the queen. Queen b5 defends the queen from danger and hits the white queen. And Magnus calculates right here. He can just drop back. His calculation ends with a retreating move. Why? Because he's going to play rook b1 next. Look at his pieces. Every single piece he has is playing. The relative value of his pieces is not three points. The relative value of some of these pieces is like four, five. And then he plays one of the most counterintuitive moves you will ever see. I just keep applauding this Catalan bishop, right? Bishop takes d5. Oh my god, what? Well, 
because the queen can't take, the pawn has to take, freezing the center, and I just get in. And once I get in, I'm gonna eat this too, and then I'm gonna eat this, and then I'm gonna, I'm just gonna eat everything. I take on b7. And then when you, when you wall off your queen from the rest of the board, Magnus arrives on f5. Look at this position. These three pieces have a meeting with this king. This queen is over here. The mobster is alone in his office. Magnus plays knight f7. Queen goes back. Look at this interesting queen. Queen sacrifice defensive measure. No, he just takes on c5. He just takes everything. Takes all his pawns back. Queen f6, a trade, and very simple conversion. Just push. Very effortlessly transitioning the game into an endgame. This knight paralyzed, cannot come back. The rooks are defending. The knight tries to come back into the game only to be hit with a bishop pin. If it moves, that's mate. Knight f7, knight d6, and Magnus wins this game effortlessly, getting it down to an endgame, simply up two pawns, and Anish Giri resigns. How does he make it look so simple? I mean, it's, un it's just unbelievable. Like I, So in this game, his opponent played a slightly delayed capture on c4. Magnus played this exotic knight a3, voluntarily damaged his structure, and played the game entirely on the queen side, right? He just played on the queen side. Everything he did was queen side based for a while. And then he sacked a rook, tied black sh like shoes together again, and right here found this beautiful bishop takes d5. Totally counterintuitive idea, giving away his prize piece and swarming the black king just to transition everything to an endgame and win anyway. Okay, the third game that I have for you is against Richard Report. Report, a very strong player, also from Hungary. Um, and this one, an early capture on c4. And last time we saw Portich play knight bd7, Report plays knight c6. This is one of the most direct and confrontational ways of playing the Catalan. The idea being rook b8 and b5, and a little bit more aggressive than knight on d7. So Magnus castles and basically says, I don't care, I'm down a pawn. Look at this move. Bishop to, not to f4, not to g5, here. What? What? That is so stupid looking. Very simple. He wants to play queen c1. And just like he did against Portish, he just wants to play b3. Now in this case, in the Portish game, the knight was there. So this was possible. Right now, that would simply hang a knight. But this absolutely absurd overprotection of the center enables the queen to move. And in this game, he's not moving this knight at all. You'll notice that this knight is not going to a3 anymore. It's not going to d2, and it's not going... He's waiting. He's just waiting. Pokes at b3, and report gives back the pawn. So this is very typical stuff for the Catalan. People give back the pawn, and now he's going to try to fight for the light squares in the center. Magnus forces the knight to go there, and now the bishop will move. So, bishop will move, and very often in these Catalans, when the bishop goes out there, it dies. It is... It, it knows its fate is going to be to take on f6. And white would love to regroup on the dark squares. Notice that if white trades the dark squared bishop, he's going to have six pawns on dark squares. So you're replacing everything on the dark squares. Very, very positional, right? Now knight bd2. So very interesting. This pawn's weak. B file and C file are wide open for action. Knight e5 is a common idea, right? This knight might go here or here. This queen we always know drops back. We've seen him drop it back. So there's, there's that. And now rook fc1. So we know all these different overlapping ideas, but only Magnus knows exactly how to put them in order. Knight d7 back. Now Magnus, we already know, this queen's going to go somewhere, all right? It goes to a4. So that pawn is threatened, okay? Report here can try to defend it, but putting that pawn on that square is also not a huge improvement because this bishop will be traded. Like, th this is not what's going to happen right now, but like, imagine this. I mean, this pawn is weak forever. It's just a weak pawn forever. So report says, all right, I'm going to solve my problems tactically, c5. I'm just, I have two stupid queenside pawns. I'm going to get rid of them. Magnus says, okay, but what about a7? I'm, I'm just a pawn up now. Right, so the Catalan is all about posing these practical, difficult problems. Queen takes a7, report plays bishop takes f3. Bishop takes f3 and takes on d4. And from this point forward, what Magnus does is nothing short of spectacular. The position is equal, right? It's move 19. The game ends in 10 moves. How? How does that make any sense? It's not like anybody's going to lose by checkmate. What is White's best asset? What is White's best asset? What is White's strongest asset? It's this pawn. Now, if I played queen takes d4 in this position, you would pin my rook to my, my queen to my rook. So that would not work. But Magnus plays rook a2. And then he plays a4. 
And then he does take the pawn on d4, which Report could have defended, chose not to. I guess Report didn't want to waste time and also weaken the light squares. So he plays rook fd8. Now Magnus takes, brings his queen back, and he just goes. And the queen slides out of the way. And the rook slides to the c-file to protect everything else. And the queen comes forward. And then he takes the knight. The rook falls because of this, then this. And Magnus finds queen takes c7. Rook is hanging. Queen is hanging. You can go here. And the pawn promotes. A pawn became a B pawn and made it to the end of the board. Report from this position just could not handle the pressure anymore. Like, he could have played bishop d5 and tried to stay in the game. What Magnus would have done is he would have either taken on c5 or brought the queen back, something like this. And the rest of this game would have been about, can Magnus queen this pawn? It's all about these practical difficulties. I mean, this opening is a nightmare against somebody like Magnus because people already are at a psychological disadvantage when they play him. Uh, many people have said this. Like, when you play Magnus, you just want it to be over. It's like getting a blood test, all right? Like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe some of you like blood. I hate them. I faint when I... When needles prick my skin. I, I just can't do it. So, all right. But the rampage continued. Now, when you play an opening like the Catalan against Shakriar Mamidyarov, Mamidyarov is going to like to have fun with you. All right, he, he likes, Mamidyarov likes to party. So he takes on c4. We've seen knight bd7. We've seen knight, b, knight to c6. We've also seen bishop e7, castle, and take. Now bishop b4 check. So another one of the main lines of the Catalan is taking on c4 and giving this check. Because what it does is it activates a piece with a tempo, attack on the king, and forces white to block. Now, the best move here is bishop d2. The point is that after this, you kind of help white develop. All right? you, you don't really want to give white any benefits in the Catalan, especially if it's Magnus. Um, so a5 is what black does. There's also c5. So oops, c5. So you try to defend the bishop, and you know if, if the white could do this, it's not very good, though. And you really don't want black to just improve their position. So a5. And now we have castles and castles. And um, Magnus plays e3. So he's preemptively closing the cage shut. So this is a totally different approach than we've seen thus far. We haven't seen the structure. Last game I thought about the structure, but only in the case of the bishop being traded. When Bizarre here plays rook a6, which looks like a 500 level move. Like, you know how if you let like a little kid play chess, they're going to play a5 rook a6 because that's the way they think they have to develop. Um, yeah, well, it's completely legitimate. And now, once again, we see this sort of queen, weird, mysterious move on c2. Maybe we're going to take, maybe we're going to do something else. Mabiziarov plays b5. So again, we see another game of somebody trying to hang on to those pawns. This time, instead of b3, because the queen side is already kind of sophisticated and expanded, Magnus plays a4. So this time, he's trying to poke at the queen side with the a pawn. c6, defending everything, but getting in the way of your rook and your knight. Okay, now this time Magnus does put this knight on c3. So totally different, totally different approach. Spider web of pieces over there. If you take, I would honestly think that the best move here is what? What is the best way to recapture? How is your Catalan brain? Tell me in the comments. You can pause here. Catalan brain, queen side pressure. What's the best move? It's got to be b takes. Why? Because you're going here next. That is, that is the way you're going to play this position laser beaming on that queen side, solid center, and you're going to try to play e4, bishop g5, knight e5, or pawn to e5. It's got to be b takes. Rook b6 is what Mohamed Yarov chooses, and now Magnus plays e4. He just played e3, but the queen side is frozen, so it's time to show the other layers of the Catalan. e4, e5, locking up the center, and now we have take, take, and once again, a capture in the center of the board. Now, you might say, Levy, wait a minute. Isn't that a thing? Yes. I think this was a sacrifice by Mamidyarov. Mamidyarov voluntarily did this because maybe he blundered, but he's down in exchange. He's down a rook for a bishop, but he's got good pressure on the center. And as you can see, computer is not super convinced that white is winning. And there's b4 and b3. Like, you give white one bad move. Like a couple of passive moves, I mean, this is this this position could very well be a problem for White. So White's got to play every move usefully and accurately, and Magnus does by moving his rook to the other side of the board. Now, if you move your bishop, I'm going to trade rooks with you, which will help White a lot, because White needs to trade a few pieces to neutralize the black position from its forces. H6. Here comes the other rook. Mamidyarov consolidates. Here, Magnus plays. Just a very, very nice move. 
plays queen d1. Queen d1 is an admission that the d4 pawn is weak and you have to defend it. But the Catalan is never truly over. The pressure is never truly over. B4, when just when you think black is the one calling the shots, you say, Levy, you said rook f8 and everything. Yeah, then bishop f8 and the bishops together with these pawns are going to really terrorize this white position. But it's never over. B3. That same menacing move. What does black do? If this, at some point I'm going to take, okay? At some point. But if you go here, protected, pass pawn, two squares away from queening, looks good for white. Not against Magnus. Rook a6 attacks the queen, and knight e1 back. I'm going to blockade you, and I'm going to get in front of your pieces. I'm going to pressure everything over here. And another player who can't handle the pressure, Mami Jarvis just couldn't handle it anymore, tries to break out, tries to force his way out of the position by taking everything. And Magnus just plays rook takes bishop. c2, and queen to e1. Hits the knight. Covers the promotion, and also behind the knight is the bishop. That is it. You are not going to be able to defend against all of these threats, and another 2700 level grandmaster goes down in 30 moves against Magnus Carlsen. It's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just like it, he just makes it look so effortless. He also played Chinese grandmaster Wang Hao in 2022. This one, all right, you're going to recognize this. Where have we seen this before? This is the game against the Niche Giri. Bishop takes, pawn takes. Anish played bishop d7 in that game. Magnus played a4 in that game. All right, Anish played. Okay, bishop a3, rook e8. It's the same game. Same game, knight bd7. Same exact game, right? But this time, Magnus doesn't take the pawn on c4. Wait, what? That wasn't part of the plan. Why is he not taking the... Why is he adding more pressure to the pawn, but not taking it? Remember this e4 idea? Well, because he probably was like, Wang Hao saw that game. It's been about eight months, maybe six months since that game. So Wang Hao's prepared, but he's not prepared for my deviation. Rook e1 trying to play e4, Wang Hao plays a5. Look at this. Rook e1 threatens e4 after a5 committing... Now I'm going to go here. Why? Well, I'm asking your position a new question now. A5 prevents me from playing A5, but it could be a weakness in the long run on these squares and maybe B7. So now, I'm going to trade the bishop with you. This is your powerful piece. Look at this. This holds your entire position together. Let's just trade. We haven't seen that before yet. We haven't seen that in this video. We haven't seen the bishops come off. We haven't seen the white king on G2. Now this pawn is going to be taken by white. But he takes the pawn at some point, but first, he plugs the center. He completely plugs the d5 square. Now he takes on c4 the second that Wang Hao goes backwards. And look at this bishop, by the way. This is the new Catalan bishop. Magnus is reinventing the Catalan meta. The bishop on a3 is the new Catalan bishop in this game. We have knight c4, queen c4. And Magnus plays f3. Nice and solid structure. And guess what? He is about to absolutely ravage this position. Remember that move a5 in this position when Wang Hao played it? And we said there might be weaknesses. I said there might be weaknesses on b5 or b7. What I did not mention was that there might be weaknesses on the dark squares. That is all Magnus needs. Now he transfers the rook over. He transfers the queen over. And now, this is probably the most impressive move of the entire game. Magnus undevelops the Catalan bishop and moves it over here. And now black is really screwed because you have queen c6, and the rook dances back. The rook dance this game has been fascinating. Rook here, rook here, rook here, rook here, rook back. You repeat so many moves. It looks bad, but it's not. Now he takes, and here comes the collapse of the black position. The bishop comes back once again, and the pawns just never felt settled. Queen c6, and now rather than taking and allowing the queen in, Magnus gets the, tries to get the queens off. Patient. Rook d3. Rook d2, patient. King f2, patient. Not the best move. Could have maybe played queen b3 and then taken. Doesn't matter. Like without stockfish. Look at this without stockfish. He stays patient just until the very right moment. And now he takes. Rook b6, queen d8 is a back rank checkmate. Both pawns fall. Wang Hao does his best to counterattack. Let me tell you something right now. This game went 42 moves. 
Wang Hao resigned here because he was about to be down two, uh, two pawns in an endgame. This knight never moved. This knight literally went out to f6 on move one. Okay? Then on move 17, it offered an exchange. Then a few moves later, it went back. Those were the only three moves it made the entire game. That knight literally never moved. It went out, back, out. That's it. That's all it did. That is how Magnus freezes his opponent's pieces in the Catalan. The knight developed, undeveloped to a trade, and went back. Three moves in 41 turns. That is crazy. That's crazy. I don't know what this is. Like, it, it, he just freezes his opponent's pieces. And last but not least, he played a game against Timur Rajabov. Now, this line we have not seen yet. DC and instead of knight a3, we have queen c2. This is the main line. Trying to win this pawn back. And here, theory goes a6. So that after queen takes c4, there is this nice tempo move. And then queen c2, whatever, and bishop to b7. So what people often do after queen c2 with white a6 is they play a4. So this is another idea to prevent b5. But recently, there has been this very trendy line, the immediate move b5. So very happily opening this diagonal. And uh, there's a lot of very sharp lines here, such as the one that you're about to see, which is a4, bishop, b7. Giving up a pawn. Just sacrificing the pawn, but not just that one. Also the pawn on c4. So black goes from being up a pawn to down a pawn, but the computer evaluates this position as equal because after this exchange on d4, basically the computer is like, look, this is an extra pawn, but black has tremendous activity. That's what black, that's what, what the computer says. It says, despite white being up a full pawn, position is equal. The problem is that sometimes to achieve that, you have to play a line like knight takes f2, rook takes f2, bishop takes g2, knight takes e6 counter, f e6, king g2, knight b4, rook a8, queen a8, checking the king, blocking the check, Bishop f6, queen c4 hitting the pawn on e6, knight d5. And black is still down a pawn, but apparently this position is equal. It, like, it's hard to play chess like this. It's not easy to play chess like this, guys. I mean, I'm just telling you, you know? It's not easy. So, this opening is good for Magnus because it poses his opponents concrete questions and makes them actually play practical chess. So, knight e c5, and white is immediately slightly better. Bishop takes, queen takes. So now we've seen again the bishop. But this is a total freestyle Catalan. This position doesn't match anything that we have seen thus far, except you could argue one game. Do you remember which game? I'm going to give you a hint. What is white's biggest asset? The report game. Remember the pass pawn? But how is this going to... You can't go here or here. So what do you do? First you play solid. Okay. Then you develop. And then here you play queen b1. The idea of this move is that, yes, you can block me for now, but I'm going to continue to undevelop. I'm super solid. Your position is relying on my pieces not being able to push you out. Look at, look at how active black is. But look at white. White's just playing defense, staying patient. In this position, Magnus plays king f1. King comes to the party. That is such a rare move. And it is the best move. It is the top move of the engine. If you let the engine think here, it'll look around and it finds nothing. The only move it finds, the only way to make progress here is bringing the king. Do you understand how deflating it is by black that your pressure is about to not work because white brought his king like, the king is not supposed to partake in a violent fight like this. Like, that's not the way chess works. But now here comes the rook, which couldn't move because the king wasn't guarding the pawn. Next comes the knight. And now it's the great untangling of the white position. Knight b3, we trade rooks. I come back to hit your queen. Now I move my rook out. And suddenly black is like, wait a minute. This hasn't worked, because white is going to go here, trade everything, kick me out and promote. Rajaba feels the pressure, and he tries to trade the knights, and now white just goes here, 
brings the king out of danger once again. Gets the rook to the back rank, second to last rank. And Rajabo plays one aggressive move to try to play g4. Here comes the queen. It hits the knight. The knight backs up. The, knight, the queen pins the knight to the queen. There's a little dance. And b4. And b5. And queen moves. And queen a6. And black resigned. He resigned because the pawn broke free. Black was never going to be equipped to stop it. You see, this last game is the new meta of the Catalan. Like, the engine shows that you can give this pawn away completely. You can just totally give away this pawn. This is what the computers have done to the Catalan now. Black was up a pawn, now white is up a pawn. But how are you going to allow white to be up a pawn and play the Catalan? Well, this is like I said, it's like the meta. But the meta is tough to play when you don't know what you're, when, like, you don't know the top computer moves. So, in this video, we watched Magnus, his first Catalan win, basically, at a high level against Portish in 2006, 2005, 7, around then. And then we watched him beat an average rating of about 2760 over the last year in 2022. This is not fair. Someone needs to petition that Magnus Carlsen cannot play the, the, the Catalan in classical chess. He just can't. It's not fair. Someone's got to do something about it. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. But I hope you learned. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you want me to make videos like this in the future where I check how a player specializes in opening, do let me know in the comments. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.